Hello, this is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoy this video. Good evening, everybody. This is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. Welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast. For this week's cast, we're actually going to be recording and putting up in relatively short order, as we have a Kickstarter to talk about tonight. But first, let's welcome back contributor and co-host for Game Wisdom, James Ellaby. Hey, guys. James, it's great to have you on. I think, I, I'm not sure, is this our first cast sit with you with the fix to your headset, I think? Yes. Uh, uh, well, no, last cast was, uh, was, was uh, I had it. I had it last time. Cool. But, yeah. As we're, this is going to probably be a little weird for those of you listening to these casts, but because we're going to be posting these a little bit out of order, you may be hearing a future cast with James still sounding like I did, like in the submarine underwater. But we were able to figure out the issue with his headset, getting it set to Skype, so he should be coming in a lot clearer for future casts going on. But for our main guest tonight, he is returning and a fan of the site. Of course, you probably know him as owner and lead designer for Arkin Games, and they are currently, as we are recording, having a Kickstarter up for the sequel to AI Wars. So please welcome back to the cast, Christopher Park. Hey, thanks for having me back. Hey, Chris, it's great to have you on. We were talking about this before the cast, so it's certainly been a while since we last spoke. It has. Yeah, I've been uh, yeah. incognito from a lot of casts and so forth uh, through 2015 yeah. in particular. I know, and uh, for today's cast, for those of you listening, we're going to be catching up with Chris about some of the challenges that's been happening with game development, especially with Ark. And for fans of the site, I know we've all been, I hate to say, sort of watching things, watching the trouble from afar, but I definitely wanted to talk to you about Chris, and especially with James here. James, as we as we talked about before, has primarily been a console gamer, and I, this will be, I think, a good way for him not only to talk to another developer but also for people listening about some of the challenges that go into game development james i think you were talking about this just before we started the cast. yeah definitely so one second here just got another pop-up and as we were saying there's always a tons and tons of information about the successes when a game you know releases two millions of dollars to press coverage all around. But there's very little information, especially very little information for people trying to learn the industry when things don't go so well. And it's a definitely it's a hard pill to swallow, but it is a conversation we need to have, especially as more and more people are entering the industry pretty much daily at this point what yes you say, definitely James? yeah it's uh, it's uh uh with with uh ease of software and higher power compute uh computing uh more easily accessible to students uh you're you're it's definitely a booming time in the industry and with that you definitely need to have all sides of of it and that's why we need uh people like you chris um to really help show you know help show a lot of these young people and a young uh and new people in general, you know what, what what's going on? Yeah, I'm I'm ancient at, at 33. I'm uh, I'm an <laughs> <Whoa>. old man. <laughs> Retirement. Yeah, I'm right getting the up there you, too. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> There's how many? Uh, when I started this uh, seven years ago, I used to think, you know, and I think I remarked a number of times, you know, how many 40 year old um, people do you know in the Mm -hmm. development side of the games industry because uh for the most part you know this is really just at the start of the indie revolution so that was mm -hmm. not really a long-term career path that anybody had ever had um in a in a large sense there were certainly people that had been around for a while uh doing that mm -hmm. but there weren't people that had released a lot of games yet and that had had you know wide 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 commercial success and recognition and so it was all triple a mm -hmm. with that it's kind of like you know you get chewed up and spit out when you're 
in your mm-hmm. 20s or late teens, probably in your 20s, uh, mm-hmm. for not great pay and you have the long hours and then, you know, you're working for somebody else and then it's like, okay, I can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. And then a few people, uh, you know, make it to kind of head positions and then stick around. The Sid Meyers and the Peter Molyneux and, you know, mm-hmm. various other ones like that. Um, not that I necessarily equate those two. Those are two very different people. But, you know, mm-hmm. they're both ones that have been, um, that have survived Me. long-term through that AAA gauntlet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's definitely one of the that definitely brings up another kind of interesting debate we've been talking about with the game industry and how it's one of the few industries where the people who make the games, the people who are doing this, are most often relatively unknown, especially in the AAA space. We've brought this up countless times on the cast, but how many people know who the lead designer is on? Call of Duty or the latest Gears of War. Right. I mean, I don't even know. And even, I don't know either. But when we look at the indie space and just that greater level of transparency, it's a lot easier to see those people. But again, it's not really considered like the same sense like when you hear a famous writer or a famous director on a TV show or movie. You know, they say, you know, the executive producer from The Walking Dead or writer on X or whatever, like that is usually used as a marketing point. But I know there's debate, especially among other developers, about whether the designer should be, you know, put above everyone else. You know, as we see, as we just mentioned with Sid Meier, you see like on the civilization, it's always called Sid Meier Civilization. And that was actually a joke from, I think, Robin yeah. Williams uh, told him to do that <laughs> as a joke. And um, back in the 80s mm-hmm. and act because he was nobody back then. And I th- but I think he knew I think it was Robin Williams <laughs> who said, like, hey, you should just, you know, put your name on it. Like it's some sort of mm-hmm. like you're some sort of celebrity. Mm-hmm. And really? So he, wow. Yeah. You have to look it up. I probably mangled <laughs> that. That's, that's probably a half truth. But at any rate. <laughs> Apparently that's what happens, and so that's why he's such a household name, and, I, um, and 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 that's just such a weird backstory <laughs> to it. Uh, so, James, I think that means I need to start calling this Josh Beiser's game wisdom from Josh Beiser's. That's going to be the new yep. thing now. <laughs> TM, don't forget to TM yeah, that man. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So and sue every other Josh. Yes. Copyright Josh for. <laughs> Copyright Josh. Go. Perfect. That's the new plan for 2017. <laughs> now forget Patreon. Yeah. Man. You, you don't need Patreon yeah. anymore. <laughs> so um, with the game industry, as we were saying, the AAA space is not known to be developer friendly. And it's why we've really seen the growth of the independent market. You can make games that you want. You're not you know, held to a publisher or having to manage dozens of employees. As we've said, the indie explosion has certainly happened over the last, I would say maybe the last seven, seven-ish years, maybe seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was starting in 2008. Mm-hmm. You, you, you were starting to see like uh, World of Goo and a couple of others. I mean, if you go way back, um, way back, mm-hmm. you know, 2004 yeah. and so forth. Then you could see uh, a few things like Geometry Wars, mm-hmm. I think, was that year. And um, so there were some big hits then. But basically, any further back than that, and you get into shareware territory, mm-hmm. and that's not really the same. That that was kind of the precursor to indie stuff. Yeah. And then there was that kind of dead period. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you know, there was Braid and World of Goo in 2008. Mm-hmm. And so those those were big, notable things. Mm-hmm. But then there really wasn't a whole lot else mm-hmm. that people were aware of. Yeah. And then Minecraft hit in 2009 mm-hmm. and um, in, in a major way. Anyway, that's when it really took yeah. off was that summer. Yeah. And then, of course, the iPhone. Uh, I think the App Store really started opening up. Mm-hmm. I don't think the App Store took submissions until like 2010 i want to say yeah and 
What year was uh, Super Meat Boy? Uh, Evan Mullins. Uh, I want to say I believe 2011. Let me see. Now you got me thinking about that. I was just about to say that. Because I, I I thought that was a little bit older, but may, maybe you're right. Maybe the original. I guess 2011 was about five years ago. Right? The original version, the Flash game, was 2008. You're right. Ah, uh, yeah. And Swing was released. Um, according to Wikipedia, it was released on in October 2010. When Super Meat Boy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Well, I remember they were still showing it PAX yeah. East 2011, which is early 2011. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking it had to be around that time period. But I guess they were just, that was so popular. They were still mm-hmm. riding that train. Yeah. And as you were saying, Chris, regarding the indie series, like before 2014, there were some developers i know crow team's been around since the 90s spire web software and of course introversion yeah but oh yeah as you saying as we all know they they weren't household names like when we think of braid fez super meat boy and it, obviously minecraft and the right. market has certainly changed to the point where you if your game if you as we said it's a combination of a lot of factors especially luck but it is possible for a indie game these days to hit that level of notoriety, as we've seen recently with Undertale, Gone Home, right. Her Story, etc. And I think that it's also worth noting that um, there's a mid list, basically. Of I mean, you know, you can focus on the top of the market, and um, but I don't think that's the best measure mm-hmm. of kind of the, the the true growth of things because if you look at let's take spider web software for example i have no idea exactly how much he makes mm-hmm. um and i think that he probably from what i've read i think he makes more now than he used to but basically he used to put out a whole lot of games that i think were shareware mm-hmm. and um you know they were uh i think that he was able to do well for himself mainly because he didn't have to like reinvent the technology and the art and stuff yeah so much every time it was you know story and and so on and so um so he was able to exist in that shareware space as basically one guy who was um, i believe that he was contracting out the the art and um that you know he's he was basically making a little bit go a long way and it was enough to support one person and that's fine um nowadays you can have these there's so many games that nobody's ever oh, heard of that have made a million dollars, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a telling sort of thing. There are even more games out there that have made like next to nothing, but that's been the case for a long time anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the ones that have made some ridiculous amount of money that you wouldn't necessarily suspect, um, you know, if you go poking around on steam spy or something um then that can kind of give you an indication sometimes of it's like okay well this thing sold that many copies and it's never been on a sale so hmm do, 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 you know and you come out with some number and you're like well it's probably not really that number but one way or another it's a big number and um you know some game that you wouldn't have thought of that that uh that you've just never heard of so the notoriety doesn't necessarily go hand in hand being able to make way more than a comfortable living. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, um, there are even more ones that you've never heard of that, you know, sold next to nothing or literally nothing. And sometimes it's impossible to tell the difference. Uh, Mm -hmm. until you look at something like Steam Spy or whatever. Yeah, and I was just talking with the developer behind Star Vikings, Mark Ventrelli, on our live stream. For those of you listening to this cast, it would probably be a week, maybe two weeks from this recording. And we talked about that kind of issue, that he released this game, and like right now, I think at that time, he was saying at a zero on Metacritic. No one is reviewing his game. And... right. And the degree or how things can swing between getting people to look at your game and just, you know, disappearing into the ether 
is a very scary prospect for a lot of developers. And this is what we were talking about earlier with the fact that a lot of people don't understand just how challenging it is to release a game, or more importantly, release a game that can at least break even. And right, it's one of those discussions. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's very different now uh, than it was even in 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, for that developer, I've already forgotten his name. I'm sorry, what was the name again? Uh, Mark Ventrelli. Okay, yeah, so for Mark, I mean, um, I wouldn't worry too much about Metacritic, to be honest, uh, Mm -hmm. because as far as I'm concerned, I think that's fairly dead. Mm -hmm. Um, It used to have much more prominence and importance because mainly it was uh, shown on the front of, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, on the listings and so forth for Steam. And even then, there were a lot of indie games that didn't get the required four reviews Mm -hmm. in order to... uh, you know, Metacritic reviews in order to show up there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they would just show with no score and that was fine. And, you know, we have some games that have um, a lot of Metacritic reviews, like, I don't know, 20 or something. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of games that have zero. Um, AI War, you know, our first game, uh, when that came out in 2009, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, first nobody was paying it any mind. And then there was this kind of, um, rumbling, you know, it's snowball effect, yeah. and uh, it wound up being the 40th best reviewed PC game of that year, according to Metacritic. It was number 40 in their in their list of uh, of games. And the funny thing about that is, is that it had like an 82, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, some people would look at that and go, "Oh, I'm sorry." I'm like, "Are <laughs> you freaking kidding me? This is not school grades. Yeah. That's a." really good meta score yeah yeah definitely Um, but the player perception really was very different about that so yeah so i mean Mm. metacritic was incredibly misleading and um and people didn't understand it well and you know there's all those discussions about the seven to ten scale Mm. versus the one to ten scale you know and so uh now that we've got these steam reviews everybody sees that Mm -hmm. and I feel like those honestly pull more weight than anything else in terms of reviews. And what pulls the most weight of all are things like the YouTubers and the Twitch streamers and that sort of thing. And certainly getting press coverage is important. But, um, you know, if we look at... um, It's always been the case for many, many years where we would, if we got talked about on Rock, Paper, Shotgun or Total Biscuits channel or something like that, or Kotaku, um, we would see a bump from Kotaku and Total Biscuit that we could perceive. Mm -hmm. Uh, We would see a bump in sales that we could perceive and that would last for a little while. And by little while, I mean a few hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and other than that, nobody ever moved the needle. Now, what's interesting is that with um, Kickstarter, since we're doing that, um, you know, mm-hmm. generally speaking, news uh, places don't co- cover uh, Kickstarters. Mm-hmm. You know, since this is a sequel to a game that a lot of people are excited about, and you know, all these large places have covered uh, the game, uh, they're they're covering the Kickstarter too. And um, that's been something that we've been extremely fortunate in. And some of the indies that we've talked to, like Steam Dev Days, were just like, what? Rock, Paper, Shotgun, you know, wrote about it and stuff. Like, they don't write about Kickstarters usually. And what's funny, though, is that um, only about 2.5% of our amount pledged, pledged came from Rock, Paper, Shotgun uh, links. And that's like $1,400. Mm-hmm. And while that that's out of um, like we're fifty seven thousand right now, so that sounds like a lot. And actually, that is the biggest source of anything that's not our site or Google or or Twitter or uh, Kickstarter itself. So that make puts that at number one. You know, PC Gamer they wrote about it. That chucked in you know eight hundred eighty five bucks so far. That's one point five 
percent. So I mean, that's the next biggest one, and then it's just down from there. Um, mm-hmm. And so the amount of coverage that uh, th- that some of the developers that are kind of new to the market might think, oh my God, you know, I'm not getting covered on all these uh, on all these websites, and therefore um, that is what's killing my profits. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not so sure that's really what's happening. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what's happening with a lot of this. I mean, the the phenomenon that I just described is something that is not new. That's been the case since mm-hmm. uh, we our first, the first time we were written about on RPS was, I think, well, it was the year they came out, I think, which I think was 2010. So, um, you know, they've, they've written about us once or twice a year, at least mm-hmm. for six years now. And, um, you know, they are a heavy hitting site. And I know that when sites like that write about you, it does help to indirect sales mm-hmm. later yeah. on. So there's definitely this kind of cumulative effect. Um, but, um, uh, the original AI war gained the most, uh, momentum by me going onto forums and talking to people and so forth. And then when a review would come out on some place, like Tom Chick wrote about it for Crispy Gamer at the mm-hmm. time, and Alec Mir wrote about it for um, PC Gamer, and they were both very positive about it. Uh, Jim Sterling wrote about it for Destructoid, and he was pretty positive on it, that sort of thing. Um, those reviews then kind of fueled the discussion, the discussion further. But I think a lot of the actual... Um, customers came from those sort of small places Mm -hmm. now what's really interesting though is that for us in the past always the really number one place that customers would come from was steam itself Mm -hmm. um or if it was like a humble bundle or something then you know humble um and so basically the storefronts themselves have their own built-in audiences and whatever's on the front pages of those gets views Mm -hmm. now with the flood of all the new stuff that means that doesn't you know i'm not this is where we get into territory where i'm not really sure what's happening um Mm -hmm. there's not enough space on the front for everybody anymore and so you get on the front by being popular Mm -hmm. ish you know popular new releases that's mostly how you get on there by whatever the magic algorithm is. Mm-hmm. How do you get popular exactly? Probably the press has something to do with that. Um, so you've got to have that kind of zero-day press, I guess. I don't really know. Mm-hmm. I've had two botched Steam releases so far this year, and my last successful one was in 2014. It was very successful at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, that hit like half a million dollars gross within... Within six months, I, I, th- I want to say within three. I don't, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, that one was, that was the last federation. That was very successful. But then, um, you know, Release Raptor I put out at the end of August this year, and it was doing so poorly uh, that I actually decided to take it back off Steam and refund everybody and just put out the piece of the game that was there for free because it was an early access thing and I was going to need to, you know, pay to finish making mm-hmm. it and it wasn't going to it wasn't going to break even on that. So I was going to, you know, bleed money while mm-hmm. possibly disappointing people because I wasn't going to have enough time to do what I wanted. So long story short, visibility is a really big problem. Mm-hmm. And when you get to places like rock, paper, shotgun, for instance, um, I think one of the reasons why they're having less impact now than they did before is not that they have a lower, um, uh, readership if anything i'm sure they've got a much larger one but they've also got more articles going through as well and so Mm -hmm. uh just like your time on the front page of steam is a lot less your time on the front page of these major sites is a lot less i can remember with the valley without wind when that was covered on kotaku that was our first piece that that, that kotaku ever covered and that was in 2011 uh we were on the very front top of that whole site for about four hours and then easily visible for you know somewhere in the 12 to 24 hour range but i mean you get shoved off in an hour now Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. if if not more you know if not faster 
And so um, unless you've got like some sort of direct feed or like watching for specific things, um, you've got this fire hose at all the distributors, at all of the various generalist sites. You've got the specialty sites like Explorminate or something, which are just for, you know, particularly 4X strategy games. And so, you know, things are a little calmer there. And if you've got something that caters specifically to their audience, then you're going to get a much better percentage of interest, let's say. But it's by nature a smaller audience, so you've got that trade-off. So the long and short of it is I don't really – there is there is a large luck factor. And that was true in 2009 mm-hmm. and certainly before that. The luck factor has always been there. There was this magic couple of years there between like 2011 through 2013 where the degree of luck that you had to have went down a lot. And um, Mm -hmm. and that, I think, maybe wrongly set the expectations of a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't suspicious enough of that time. Uh, I should have been. I'd been really paranoid about exactly the current market that we're in now, I'd been really paranoid that was going to happen since 2010. Um, that was why I made Tidalis as our second game is to branch out genres because I yeah. felt like um, this was going to happen. It was right around the corner and then it kept not happening. And then um, 2014 slash somewhat 2015, it, it, it did happen. Mm-hmm. So yeah. now it's, now it's tough. Yeah. And, that challenge of building yourself as a company that's one of the things that uh, as we were saying at the beginning of this cast it's one of those elements that we definitely need to have more discussions on and the fact of the matter is and this is something i've been saying for the last few years especially after speaking to developers like yourself and just everyone we've had a chance to speak to is that making one game is not the same as sustaining a company and right too many people, as James was saying earlier, they get into this where they start building games thinking that, you know, it's all going to be sunshine and lollipops. I'm going to make this game. We'll release it and, you know, lo and behold, we'll become all millionaires and we retire at the age of 24. That's not right. going to happen. Even if you have one really amazing game, that's not going to essentially keep your company going for five to ten years. And as you said, Chris, earlier, it's very rare to hear of game developers in their 40s and higher. We're It's still very difficult to say, is the game industry really a quote-unquote career, something that you can be in for, who knows, 20, 30 years? <laughs> Obviously, the reason we're ask, we can't say that is we're not even, well, we just passed like 30 years since Nintendo, 1985, last year so it's like that classic uh, catch-22 when you go to like a job interview and they ask do you have five yeah. to seven years of experience with something that's only two to three years old yeah yeah i, I remember that with when c sharp mm-hmm. was new it's like we wanted you five years of c sharp it's like you know that's been a thing for mm-hmm. two years for two <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, and I think it's just, it's it's very very interesting to look at. I mean, anymore, I almost especially with listening to you guys and with doing all the podcasts here, it, it reminds me a lot of football players. Mm-hmm. Where it reminds me a lot of like the football scene where y- people are retiring at like thirty and you know mm-hmm. and at that latest forty and and because it wears it's a yeah. wear and tear it's a long process i mean uh, i'm sure chris you can speak to the how many night uh, how many gray hairs you have uh, a the, lot. of the yeah. ones of the ones that yeah. you didn't just end up ripping out in the first place you know what i mean yep. like mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. it's it, it is it is a love hate relationship mm-hmm. And I and it's a relationship with almost like a child where you're not going to see the fruits of your labor right away. And even if the child comes home with a with an A or a B on his report card, I, that's not the end. You got to keep rearing. You got to keep keep raising the child. You got to keep working with it, I guess. And that's very much reflective of the game companies where it's like it's it's not just going to give you the golden egg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you're going to you're going to have to keep taking care of it. You know, and how long are you going to be able to do that, mm-hmm. like right. realistically, yeah. without 
you know, pro- again, props to people like Chris who have still been in this game for a long time. Mm-hmm. I think that it's um, something that a lot of people don't really appreciate despite the fact that it's staring all of us in the face constantly Mm -hmm. is that even these giant companies, um, I mean, mostly developers, but honestly, some of the publishers, um, they are one major failed game release away from dissolution. And, um, you know, we've seen that with like THQ. I mean, it took more than one failed game release Mm -hmm. to knock them out. But I mean, uh, you hear about, these new, not new, but you hear new news about AAA companies closing all the time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not even because of a game that failed, like it did cr- well critically and it, it probably broke even mm-hmm. and it did, um, and, you know, it made its investors money and so forth. But here's that thing, you bring up retirement. Um, in this particular case, it's the investors who are deciding to retire because uh, the investors made the money off of AAA game number five, whatever it was. And they go, okay, that investment risk felt super risky in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And we got lucky and we've made our money back. And let's maybe not do that again. We have 220 people on staff now that, um, you know, I think it's time to just let them go and Mm -hmm. not have that ongoing expense anymore now that we would then have to be wondering well do we start with the fresh ip or you know triple a number five the sequel you know Mm -hmm. um and so you wind up with studios that are closing that way because the investors retire now i mean um that fatigue i think can hit um investors just as much as the developers. And I mean, you see this in Hollywood where um, so many of the mid budget, and by that I mean, you know, things that have under $20 million budget, but, you know, probably a couple of million uh, budget, a lot of those movies have disappeared mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. And it's now pretty much all 100 million plus um, safe ish tentpole intended blockbusters or really small stuff and not a whole lot in between. Mm -hmm. And a ton of those things go bust. Um, And the ones that do mega well are the ones that support the ones that go bust. And so Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a weird, you've got this dynamic in all of the creative industries Mm -hmm. right now. There's similar things uh, in the um, fiction writing space where they had the death of a mid-list author in the late 90s, and now it's all either people who don't do it for a living or people who make just, you know, not J.K. Rowling levels of money, but up there, you know. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so it it squeezes out the middle. And my great fear is that that's what is going to be happening with the games industry Mm -hmm. because um, it's a lot easier to make your first game to some extent because probably you were doing something else already. Mm -hmm. Like you probably already had a job or were in university or are living with your parents or, you know, you've, you're splitting a small apartment with six people and you're all making it, Mm -hmm. whatever the cases are, you know, you're willing to make a lot of sacrifices and kind of work out of quote unquote, your garage basically. Right. And then after you've hit that point, and you've made something mm-hmm. that you say, ah, yes, we can actually sustain ourselves on a fair living wage that's, you know, commensurate with the industry next door, like just general tech, let's say. Um, then suddenly that little, you know, extremely cheap um, experience that you had where, you know, six people cranked out something for the first game, you're like, oh, wow, that's now what we spend a month. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we know we're doing better now. So we're taking longer to do this and that and the other. Expectations are higher now and yada, yada, yada. And so you see a lot of, I I would not call them one-hit wonders, but you see a lot of, uh, that's an unfair, that would be an unfair label. Mm -hmm. Um, But you see a lot of, 
um, people that make one game and they're able to do it because they're willing to accept certain working conditions mm -hmm. for that one game that they wouldn't for, you know, their general job. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a, that's a, that's a kind of a uh, tough thing as well. And then of course, for the people who are making games as a job um, and they're making more than one, um, those people have to compete with the people who are eating ramen and making, you know, just, you know, the first game, you know, so the people eating ramen might be able to make a game for some ridiculously tiny budget, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, um, you know, those same people would cost the same as a larger uh, team if it was their second game. But since it's their first, it's, mm -hmm. it's the ramen game. Yeah. You know, I made the original AI war for a budget of $2,000, mm -hmm. you know, wow. uh, the, the sequel, um, you know, that's going to take 300,000. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just a tad. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And communicating <laughs> that is another major point about the game industry. We've, again, you can have a drink every time we bring this up, but trying to educate people about what exactly goes into making a video game is very difficult. And as you just said, Chris, you have games like the four people living all in like the same apartment eating ramen and, you know, going to the dollar store for all their meals, they're making a game the same way as a company of 10, 15 people who all, you know, have mortgages and they're all trying to hopefully make enough to support their families. And the quality of the game, especially in today's market, doesn't really is not really being translated by the price. And you can see this on right. Kickstarter as well. You have games on Kickstarter that are asking, you know, $20,000, you have $500,000, and it's sometimes it's hard to tell just exactly where that money is going into, and more importantly, it's very hard to communicate that to people. When they see something like a uh, ukulele, which was only asking, I think, for like 250000 or 500000 for their game. And then when you have games like that, then people start saying, well, why are you asking so-and-so and -so your game doesn't look anywhere like that? Right. Yeah, and I mean, it's tough. And you get some of the really, really high-profile ones like uh, uh, yeah, like Mighty Number no. 9 and stuff, and you're like, mm -hmm. that was a lot of money. Like, yeah. what, where, like, uh, okay, you know, what happened? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I'm not suggesting malfeasance mm -hmm. at all. Um, but when you have a sizable staff and you're trying to do whatever it is you're trying to do, um, mm -hmm. you, you're going to have the same burn rate per month. And, uh, that's one of the challenging things is the, the larger you grow your staff mm -hmm. and in general, the larger your monthly expenses are like, for instance, don't get office space. <laughs> Office space yes. is like the worst investment ever. Um, you know, mm -hmm. those sort of things add up. And um, if you are going to take, you know, seven months to, to make a game, uh, as a let's say the designer just needs seven months to really get it right, regardless of, you know, exactly how polished the animations are or, you know, how detailed some of the graphics are or how big the soundtrack is or all the various other things. Um, it's going to take the designer that long because ultimately you can only squish design so much before mm -hmm. bad things happen or it just doesn't squish any further. Um, then you can wind up with saying, okay, well, if you have another um, $40,000 worth of people per month who are um, either doing work or kind of having to hang out uh, while the designer does their mm -hmm. thing, um, well, then you can see where, you know, a million or uh, some odd dollars can go pretty yeah. fast when you're like, that doesn't look like a million dollar game. It's like, well, mm -hmm. it's because of who made it. Um, and it's not a slight on them even. It's just the realities of big companies versus small companies. And, and I don't. I also want to make it really clear. I don't begrudge like the ramen noodle, uh, the ramen noodle um, 
people. I mean, you do what you got to do to to make your dreams uh, come alive. But um, most of the time, those ramen people are going to turn around, and within a few years, they're the non ramen people competing with their past selves. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And so. And I mean, I mean, that's, that's me. To some extent. I wasn't eating ramen. I had a different job, but it was just, it was my hobby. I didn't think I was going to sell it. Um, I made it for me mm -hmm. and my, you know, for me and my dad, and my uncle to play and, you know, and then the indie stuff started becoming a bit of a thing. I was like, wow, I guess I could sell this. So let's have a soundtrack and, uh, you know, what do you know? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that was a fantastic return on development. It's not for, uh, on investment. I mean, it's not often you get, you know, $1.2 million back from 2000, but, um, you, you know, overall <laughs> it wouldn't have earned that much had we not done expansions and a bunch of other stuff. So it's not like we really had that, mm -hmm. that return, but, um, you know, it's easy to get sucked into that mindset mm -hmm. of, aha, we're going to have these sort of returns. And as a developer, you can go, well, we're bigger now, we're better known now. Um, mm -hmm. we can probably sell $2 million worth of stuff on our second game just because of all the advantages we have now that we didn't before. Mm -hmm. And especially in today's market, I think that's a big, big, big mistake. Yeah. And it's, again, as, as you've been saying over the last few minutes, Chris, that that second game from a studio, from a group of people, is pretty much when we see sort of the make it or break it in a lot of cases. When you're no longer yeah. that unknown person who just popped up somewhere with a great game. Now you have to show to people that that wasn't just a one-hit wonder. That you can actually turn this into a mm -hmm. successful business model. And right. we've seen, this is something I've been saying for the last few years, that... Just making one game these days really isn't enough to secure yourself in this industry. You need to prove to people that you can make multiple games. And as we've seen, as you were saying a few, earlier in the cast, Chris, that challenge of deciding where you want your company to go in terms of its direction is a major hurdle. We've seen companies that stick with one genre or one particular game, just as we've seen indie developers who... They make whatever, you know, they'll have a RPG, then they'll have a first person shooter, then they'll have a roguelike. And it's very hard, again, with this market to know what is my game going to make an impact. And right. especially at, of, as lead designer owner of Arkham Games, I know you can certainly attest to that with the sheer variety of games you've put out over the last few years. Yeah. And I mean, like Angry Birds, I mean, I like to point to that one. That was, I think, their 52nd yeah. game. You know, you've not heard of the other 51. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but then, you know, number 52 just goes nuts. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, uh, I think that with Jonathan Blow is an interesting case to look at mm -hmm. um, because, you know, he made Brave, mm -hmm. right, in 2008. And, um, Based on, you know, sales numbers that are public for, you know, XBLA as well as, you know, Steam and and so on. I mean, it's on every platform, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's clear he made a lot of money mm -hmm. on that. And so there's an example of somebody who is set after one game. He can retire if he wants mm -hmm. to. I mean, he did the whole thing himself and then he hired somebody to do the art of it. Now, at that point... Um, He's at a crossroads. Mm -hmm. He can either say, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to make a big game company out of this mm -hmm. now. I mean, you know, not big, but I mean, like, you know, five people. Yeah. Um, and uh, with that, he would then be able to do a whole bunch of new things and, um, you know, presumably bigger and better things. But he also um, increases risk to yes. himself quite a bit um, and time pressure. Now, I noticed that he didn't really seem to do that. Um, I mean, I think he brought on a couple of people, but for the main, he was, um, I, I think it was mostly just him and then like maybe one or two other people. Um, and, and for somebody who made that much money, that's still basically like staying solo. Mm -hmm. um, and he, um, you know, came out with The Witness uh, not all that long ago. And I mean, that took him a long time. That was 
like what, seven, eight Mm -hmm. years, I guess. And I don't think it matters to him, you know, because if he's being at all smart with like investments and stuff, um, then to my mind, he's kind of living the dream of where it's like he gets to make exactly the games that he wants to make on exactly the sort of time scale that is comfortable to him. Uh, I don't think he's beholden to anybody. Um, Mm -hmm. And any sort of money that the witness makes, I mean, obviously he's going to want it to make money, Mm -hmm. but I don't think that he's dependent on it in the same way that, you know, triple a studio number six is you know those guys Mm -hmm. if their next game doesn't sell x many million or hundred thousand of copies then you know they're toast they're out the door Mm -hmm. whereas i don't think that's the case with jonathan blow so he's been to my mind very conservative Mm -hmm. and um and i think that actually suits him well i went the other route and it's caused me uh no end of trouble Mm -hmm. um but at the same time um i've put out a lot I've been able to do a lot more things a lot more quickly than Jonathan Blow has. Some of those have been well-received, some not. And I don't regret the choices that I've made there because, it, you know, it's given people careers and so forth. And I love working with the people that I work with and all that sort of thing. But in the modern market, um, you know, when I made those decisions, the market was different. And in the modern market, mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. staying small is the smart choice because you have to assume that your second game is going to be potentially a flop. And actually my second game was, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, tight Alice was an enormous financial flop and that almost put us out of business. But then our, um, second expansion pack, Mm -hmm. um, to AI war, uh, kicked in and we, you know, rebounded from that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had flops, off and on since then, as well as some, you know, big hits. So it's, um, it's a fraught and somewhat unpredictable, uh, market there. And I mean, that may sound really, really down in terms of, uh, you know, advice to new people, but, um, you know, you can do so much on your own now and working with, you know, some contractors that, you know, a contractor is different if you're like saying, hey, I'd like for you to create some art, you know, this is the, like, here's the art I want. We agree on a fee and you do it and you give it back to me. Mm -hmm. Um, That's very different from having somebody that's overhead um, because you're not having to wait. Uh, You're not still having to pay them. If you're stuck on design, you're not still having to pay them. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's not the kind of company that I want to run. Um, it may be the kind of company that I wind up having to run mm-hmm. in the long term. I hope that's not the case. But I mean, um, I make enough money. The Arkin makes enough money at this point that um, you know it can support me, where I basically am in a Jonathan Blow sort of situation, mm-hmm. um, but not with a bunch of money stored up, just with residuals coming mm-hmm. in. Um, but when you start looking at, you know, three people full time, then, you know, we're kind of hand to mouth, you know what I mean? And so that, uh, but at the same time, you're not going to be like, well, I'm dumping you out of the boat cause it's riding low in the water. You know, mm-hmm. Y- y- mm-hmm. you, you only want to dump people out of the boat if it's otherwise the boat is sinking, yeah. you know, and cause it's just, it's just really not very ethical, mm-hmm. especially with people that helped you you know, build the boat to begin with. I'm really going with that metaphor apparently, (laughs) (laughs) but you know it, so there's a whole bunch of stuff with ethics and and so on there too. And so, um, you know, my advice there to people who are entering this specific market is to be careful Mm -hmm. of the obligations that you make to whether that's office space, other staff, co-owners, uh, players, all that sort of stuff. Like if you're promising like a year of free updates, well, you'd better have a plan yeah. for if you don't have money coming in for that, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, otherwise don't make that promise, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and as, you, as you're saying, Chris, especially that challenge just uh, growing your company between keeping with what works or staying small or going big 
it's something that we hear from a lot of developers. They have their first game it's a success, and then they think about, oh, well, now we have all this money in. Let's, you know, make our game ten times bigger. Let's add five <laughs> more people to the staff. And we see that in some cases, it works. We've seen so many developers who go big, they manage to get a win, and it keeps them going. But in a lot right. of cases... If that game doesn't do well or it it doesn't immediately sell like gangbusters, that company's going out. And as you were saying earlier, a lot of AAA studios are in that very sticky position where they are one game failure from being closed. And I man, I think that is kind of the de facto mm-hmm. AAA studio state. Mm-hmm. Um is that unless they are an absolutely marquee developer mm-hmm. that is a household mm-hmm. name, then you should assume they are one failure away from dissolution. Wow. I mean, I, I would, I would argue that that is the case. Yeah, and- um, the, the, the only, the only exceptions to that are if there's like such a talented team or they've got some sort of special mm-hmm. assets on there that they've either developed or whatever that the publisher says, well, despite the loss we just took, we want to keep you on. But I think that more often than not, the publisher is just going to dissolve that studio Mm -hmm. and like hire those people separately, Mm -hmm. you know? So you see people move, but I mean, you know, even with something like Metal Gear Solid five and stuff, all the kerfluffle Mm -hmm. around that with uh, like Kojima and stuff, him getting uh, shoved out. And I mean, Mm -hmm. that's a good example of a game that didn't get completely finished largely because of I'm going to go out on a limb here and say the general monthly cost of developing that thing was probably pretty exorbitant. And, um, you know, it wasn't, I mean, obviously we all like to dump on investors and stuff being like, Oh, you know, or, or, uh, you know, like, big studio executives for being like our quarter four, you know, numbers need to be this and this Mm -hmm. and this. And there is some truth to that for sure. Um, But even for privately held companies where that doesn't really matter in the same way, Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, you're going to see stuff that gets rushed out because of the monthly expenses. I've done it. I've had to, you know, in the past with various games and you try and make up for it afterwards. But, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's one of the things that Jonathan Blow, for instance, has never had to do that I can tell. Mm -hmm. He's to some extent, honestly, gone to the opposite extreme of he probably could have released, you know, a year earlier or something, but he felt the need to be like overly, you know, polishy with it to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. But is that necessarily like a worse approach? It may not be the smartest hold cold hard capitalist approach but if he's doing what he loves and has the money for it and is not beholden to anybody mm-hmm. i'm not about to criticize that guy for doing that and i mean obviously players benefit from it mm-hmm. um but then you have the you know 10 person team next to him that's working with a similar or smaller budget and um you know a year or two max of uh, time instead of eight mm-hmm. and um, you know you hold the two next to each other in terms of polish and you're like huh I wonder why his is so much more polished it's not eight people on it and it's like well yeah it's the you know that's why <laughs> eight years versus one or two makes a big big difference mm-hmm. yeah and as you're saying there's just so many different ways about how these uh, studios and even these teams are set up that it again goes back to what we were saying that they're really is no magic formula for making a video game. It doesn't matter if you are a team of 30 people. doesn't matter if you're a team of three people. Every video game has its own different way of being designed. And as we've seen, it's just becoming harder and harder when the failures happen. It's why for a lot of studios, even if you can at least make enough to break even... You know, you're at least somewhat saved. But as we've said, especially in any part of this industry, a complete failure. There, very few studios have the 
clout and the savings to really bounce back from that. Um, as an example, right. they just announced that the developer behind, I think, True Crime and Sleeping Dogs, their studio yeah, was put under that. very, I think, like a few days ago from our recording. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah. They were, yeah. So, I mean, like Sleeping Dogs too and stuff. I was like, okay, wow, that's mm-hmm. um, that was unexpected. But I mean, there you go. Like they, and and I can't. I read the report on that. And I, I don't remember exactly what the reasons and stuff were, but I think it was just you know basically expenses were mounting too high. Yeah, and um, and it's one of the things that you were talking earlier about, like with Kojima and like the cost of making the Metal Gear games. I've always wondered about Rockstar and. Rockstar Studios has definitely had this almost like two-faced image when it comes to the game industry. Yeah. On one hand, yes. they are one of the most prolific and well-known developers in the market. Let's face it, everyone knows what Grand Theft Auto is at this point. Although there is an interesting thing if they haven't actually put out a new game since they put out on PC Grand Theft Auto in, I think, 2015, mm-hmm. I want to say. But the actual last new game that they developed from scratch was, I think, in 2013. Mm-hmm. So it's been three years since they've had an actual game release. And mm-hmm. that studio, I only even want to think about how much money, like, are the, is their, or I'm sorry, what's considered their monthly expenses, considering everyone who right. works there. And that leads to that second feeling that there's been reports that Rockstar is one of the worst companies to work at in terms of... Right employee turnout weight rate, uh, their working conditions. I know there's a huge uh, controversy around L.A. Noir when it was released. Yes. And I've heard that sort of thing, too. And, um, you know, I have no idea about the... I mean, I've just read articles. I haven't talked to anybody, so I have no idea on the veracity mm-hmm. of it. Um, it's, it certainly sounds plausible, you know. What's interesting is that um, despite not uh putting out any games since 2013 mm-hmm. with grand theft auto online and the microtransactions in that mm-hmm. they just released a report earlier it's just like earlier this month mm-hmm. i want to say they've made i think it was like 720 million dollars in that stuff i don't remember if it was this year or in the last couple of years but i mean those guys are making money hand over fist and they've been doing like updates to GTA five, mm-hmm. which is what houses, you know, GTA online yeah. and their, you know, dev cycle has gotten longer and longer yeah. for projects. So, I mean, I don't know when we'll see GTA six and obviously they just announced, um, Red Dead, uh, Redemption Red two, Dead right? two, yeah. two. Yep. Red Dead two just came. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I didn't see when the release date. Who on knows when it's be. going to be at um, this point? Yeah, but I mean, so I mean, they're starting the hype train, so I'm figuring that maybe two years. I don't yep. know. And um, it, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough it's a tough thing. Mm-hmm. And very few companies, as we said, really have the umbrella in case something you know breaks. Um, Blizzard would be an example of a suit that has certainly made it work, but. It goes back to what we were saying earlier. People who enter this industry think they're going to be the next Blizzard or the next Nintendo or even the next um, Activision with Call of Duty. These are elements, they are exceptions to the norm. And it's very hard to communicate that to people, especially when all we hear about are the successes. I mean, with the Grand Theft Auto and Rockstar examples... I'm not sure how many people actually know about those reports about their working conditions and the issues there. They may just, all they know is Grand Theft Auto has made, who knows, you know, combined with all their games, millions upon millions of dollars. Right. From what I've heard of the Rockstar salaries, and this is complete Mm -hmm. hearsay, and, you know, it's just based on what, some former disgruntled employees said, I mean, a lot of the Kickstarters out there, including my own could be run for, you know, something like, you know, like two thirds or half of the amount of money that we're trying to run them for. Mm -hmm. uh, If we were trying to do it under those sort of conditions, Mm -hmm. basically. 
if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, but instead treating it as kind of like any other business, Mm -hmm. you know, where people have families and they go home to them and, you know, they have weekends off and that sort of thing. Um, that, that is something that, uh, it's going to drive up the price on things. And that's, you know, it's kind of that same sort of thing of, you know, when we buy a bunch of stuff that's made in China by people who are in, you know, kind of quasi slave labor Mm -hmm. conditions, like, okay, Mm -hmm. that product you got at Walmart now costs a dollar, but Mm -hmm. yeah. At what price? (laughs) The, the, the ethics behind the, the actual making of the product is, is negligible by the by knowledge you know what i mean it's one of those uh, you could you could choose to just ignore that and, and be and i think that's what what happens with a lot of uh consumers uh they they might even know that there's crap underneath the product but they're willing to ignore that to get what they want yeah. and right. uh it, it's you just don't want that happening especially with with new new developers who are like trying to make their way and think these these companies are just oh it's a happy fun company uh-huh. where we have fun and make games all the time N- no it's a business yeah. that's run by people who will throw you out if you are not making yeah. money yeah. yeah well i'll tell you who the worst boss um in the industry is though um and it's one that every new developer needs to watch out for mm-hmm. And that is yourself. You are mm. the worst. And, you know, like I didn't, there, there have been times where I have worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day for, um, ah, I think my record is maybe three straight months. Um, wow. I did it I, I've, out of this year so far. I've done it um, two months, but not all consecutive. And I don't make my staff do that because that would be monstrous. And that's part of what I mean about, you know, you're the the worst when it comes to being a boss. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, if, if, you, if you own the company, sorry, my chair squeaks. Mm-hmm. If you own the company, uh, then potentially more of the profits are yours. Mm-hmm. And there's some guilt that comes along with that. And you're going to feel uh, responsible to, you know, work more than everybody else whether whether or not it's your design that um that did it or even originally your programming or whatever um i have a hard time mustering the feeling of entitlement Mm -hmm. at any rate let's put it that way Mm -hmm. and so you know some people clearly don't Mm -hmm. (laughs) some some people come quite easily by that feeling of entitlement that like these these serfs work for Mm -hmm. me and they should get paid very little bit uh, very little, and I should get like everything. I and a lot of people that I know have a really hard yeah. time having that attitude. I, mm-hmm. I think the normal social human attitude is not that. Yeah, um, definitely. And, and 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 so that makes people who own companies who also do the work um, work themselves extra hard. And that's not unique to this business. I mean you see cheesy ads from like banks and stuff about Mm -hmm. small businesses all over the place on TV, Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, I mean, that's the case in any small business, you go to the bakery or whatever, and the owner probably feels guilty and works a bunch extra compared to like the person running the cash register. And, you know, there's, there's a huge guilt complex as well as a bunch of other things. So it's also your, it's your personal child to it's your, it's your baby. You're, (laughs) and you, it's going to pass and fail mainly by the decisions that you make. So it, it, you know, I think you do, you're entitled to that ownership of guilt, uh, you know, for, for, you know, it's uh, the, the worker to them, it's just a job, even if they have, I mean, unless they have their own stake in it, which nine times out of 10, they don't, um, the, you know, that, that's not beholden to them. It's beholden to the one that that's your, it's your brainchild. Mm-hmm. It's you. It's, it's it, and it literally is you, mm-hmm. um, and representative of you. So you, you have every right to feel every kind of way about your business. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's but it's tricky because you, I mean, it's always a team thing, and even mm-hmm. if it's one person. Brainchild, so to speak, mm-hmm. yeah. um, it it never is. Hmm. <laughs> you know, if if there's multiple people present, it never is. Just one, yeah. like if if you've got a team and there's like a, a designer and a couple of programmers and an artist and then whatever, mm-hmm. there's cross pollination between all of those, and um, and so the feeling of this is not something that just I created. Yeah. can be kind of palpable. And if you've got a community and if you listen to them at all, um, there's an enormous amount of um, ownership that they can kind of claim in there too of like, hey, um, we came up with a lot of these ideas like, and the developer implemented them and you know refined them and whatever. But like the initial idea came from somebody on a forum, you know? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So yeah. that, um, that happens in this certainly happens with my company quite a lot and I, I've seen other companies where that's the case too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and talking about sort of like that social interaction again that you know the quote unquote God complex that we can see some people fall into especially what we've heard from certain developers who have flamed out or have caused little incidents onto themselves over the last few years. I mean yeah. that's another hour two hour discussion easily I think among the three yeah. of us. I know um, we are getting, we're about an hour and ten in, and I know it, just between Chris and I, we can easily talk for three hours straight, like it's nothing. Yeah. Um, I do want to, I hate to move on, but I do definitely want to focus a little bit more on what's been happening with Ark and, and talk about the AI Wars 2 Kickstarter. Because again, if yeah. we don't do that, you know, we'll... Uh, who knows when yeah. this cast will actually be over? <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll be done yeah. tomorrow sometime. <laughs> They'll probably take the length of the Kickstarter to get this cast done if we don't move on. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So again, I f- fascinating topic. I would definitely want to talk to you more about again, like the challenges of the game industry, and again, what it means to be running your own company versus, again, as we talked about, just the one game. You know, it's just your first game, stuff like that. But the other reason why I wanted to have you on tonight, Chris, is especially a catch-up with what's been going on with Arkin. And for those of you listening to this cast who are fans, then you've no doubt have uh, been keeping an eye on games like Stars Beyond Reach and, of course, in case of emergency release, Raptor. And as we were talking about before the cast... Things have unfortunately not been going, did not go so well for them. So I guess the first part would be, obviously, would be Stars Beyond Reach, as that was that came before Raptor. So for the people listening to this cast who may not have been hearing about the game or want to know what's going on, if you wouldn't mind, I guess, filling them in on what's the state of the game right now. Sure. So I mean, we get that question mm-hmm. a lot, actually, from people who are familiar mm-hmm. with it too. Um, Right now, the game is pretty much on ice. We've got to kind of wait mm-hmm. and see um, what we're able to do with it in the future. But um, it um, is a very ambitious 4X uh, turn-based title that we were uh, working on. And um, it uh, something that I've spent um, about $420,000 uh, making and it is um, it, it's just not good enough to release uh, yet uh, we, we've had uh, a lot of testers with it and a lot of them have really enjoyed it um, but there's a difference in the enjoyment of um, this is really fun and cool I wonder what it'll turn out to be like versus oh this is it mm-hmm. you know and it's not a. It's not that the game is, like, massively. Uh, mm-hmm. oh. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, it's not like the game is uh, massively incomplete or uh, uh, small. Certainly not small. Um, but there were various. The, the game always has been in a state of incompleteness because we keep ripping out whole sections and redoing mm-hmm. them and. Uh, we eventually hit the point where I had to set that aside and say, 
okay, well, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to this. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of people that were like, oh, you know, throw it on early access. We'll, you know, we'll, you know, we'll keep funding it and stuff. And I'm like, you know, as soon as I start selling this to people, mm-hmm. uh, then I've become beholden to finish yes. it. And at that point, um, uh, not knowing that this is a game that I can like stand behind and say, Hey, this is the game we wanted to make. Or, not even that necessarily, but just like, it's okay if it's not the game we wanted to make, but it's awesome. It's just, you know, that it's a good enough game. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, then I don't want to start taking people's money yeah. at that, at that sort of stage. Cause it's a really good way to get into trouble. Oh, yeah, definitely. And so, you know, I said, no, yeah. And so we worked on um, Star, uh, Star Wars Rogue, uh, an, an action roguelike mm-hmm. um, with kind of shmup elements. And um, there were, I want to say, 11 people working full time on that one and another like, uh, I'm not sure. Um, maybe, maybe it was seven people full time and another like four working part time on it. Um, at any rate, um, for a couple of months there at the end of 2015 then we released that in early 2016 and we had to come in pretty hot on that in terms of not having a bunch mm-hmm. of time to like get it out to the press early and all that sort of thing and you know i had planned to get around that by you know, we, you know to try and offset that by doing a big promotion with a uh, humble bundle where um we gave away bionic dues an older game of mm-hmm. ours uh for free and in exchange, they also, you know, their uh, mailer and stuff, like, talked up the new game a bunch, like, you know, hey, this exists, you know. And um, that did not have the requisite offsetting, although looking at the market in general, um, maybe it actually did, mm-hmm. but the market itself is just so tricky that, you know, we came up with snake eyes, sort of, so to speak. I mean, there, there is a luck factor mm-hmm. involved. And, you know, I feel like some of our games have benefited positively from that. I think that the last federation um, maybe got a little bit more attention than it possibly should have just from a market baseline mm-hmm. standpoint. Not that it didn't deserve it, but just I think maybe it was the benefit of some positive uh, beneficiary of some positive mm-hmm. luck versus other ones. Uh, I think Star Wars Rogue is a really good game. And if we had enough reviews for it on steam it would be at overwhelmingly positive mm-hmm. and um you know it's trending that direction just incredibly slowly mm-hmm. and so um that's one where i think that i mean there were a variety of factors i'm not going to blame luck mm-hmm. um on blame it all on luck remotely or on the market i mean there were you know we didn't take the time to do the advanced marketing and that's not the fault of my marketing guy either that was actually my fault Mm -hmm. but going back to stars beyond reach and then not having budget left at that particular time and saying okay well we need to do this in this amount of time and so go 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 you know and uh so you know then the my gambit didn't pay off basically Mm -hmm. and so um then uh, we had a layoff, which was very hard. And so then we were down to um, three people full time. And um, some of the people that uh, had been contractors for um, Star Wars Rogue uh, loved it enough that they wanted to like stay on as volunteers and keep working on, you know, balance and various things on it. So they've done some amazing uh, post-release updates Um mm-hmm to it which has been really great for the game and um just in general it's been really great and um meanwhile uh keith went back to working this other programmer designer he went back to working on stars beyond reach and um basically burned down what i had done design wise and started building it up himself a different way at my request and um uh because i was basically out of ideas and kind of burned out on that sort of thing and so he then went through months of uh, working on that and working with just a just a very small number of testers and getting their feedback and was iterating with it and um, hit a point in I think May where he was saying he felt like there was basically fifty fifty odds that it would be a 
game that he felt like he could design out in a way that he would be mm-hmm. proud of. And um, he needed to get some more, you know, data and whatnot in there first and some other subsystems coded before we could kind of do end-to-end testing to make sure that that was promising enough. But um, then he had some various, uh, you know, life events and stuff come up. And so, and then I needed his help on some other things, programming-wise, you know, all hands on deck sort of Mm -hmm. thing. And so... Um, and so that's been in limbo since then. And at this point, we don't have um, a very good incentive. I mean, we've got a huge sunk cost into mm-hmm. there, um, but there's not an incentive of, oh, that's going to be like easy money to recoup mm-hmm. or something. So it's not like the top thing we want to jump on. And I really have wanted to see that project flourish, mm-hmm. but I'd also rather it not come out than come out and be bad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they'll they'll... Miyamoto quote of, you know, yeah, and a rushed game is, or, you know, a, 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 a delayed game uh, can turn out good, but a rushed game is forever yeah. bad, you know. So, I mean, I, that's kind of the attitude I'm taking with it, um, despite the, the heartburn of being that much invested into it and then it's just sitting there. Yeah. But um, so I started working on uh, 3D games when Keith switched to working on Stars Dan Reach, this was back in February. And um, I was going to work on a 3D um, kind of sandbox revival game, but with my own twist on it, because um, that was just what I felt inspired to do. Because there's one, uh, Seven Days to Die, that I really like in general, um, but only heavily modded and a specific way that I mod it and um mm-hmm. <clears throat> and i feel like it could be so much more if it was done in a different way mm-hmm. and i mean it's not that it's a bad game or or less the way that they have it it's just theirs is very divergent from uh mm-hmm. the direction i would take it yeah. so um that's that's no judgmental words there it's just a matter of uh two different kind of design philosophies and so i wanted to kind of toe into that water some then i decided okay you know making a full 3d survival game is not the best use of uh you know that's not exactly the most safe of things to do why don't i make something smaller in the meantime i've always wanted to make a velociraptor game and um you know you can actually play as a utah raptor or dynanicus in a valley without wind one and two some older games that we've Mm -hmm. made and um so um so I started working on in case of emergency release Raptor and, um, that, um, I released into early access in late August and the response was decidedly uh, absent. Mm -hmm. I suppose is really the answer. Um, it wasn't that it got like poorly received, um, or all that well received. Mm -hmm. It just, mostly was ignored um there were a lot of people who misunderstood what it was and felt like it was a goat simulator clone which uh was then really frustrating Mm -hmm. some of the other people who were writing steam reviews who were like is it because it has an animal Mm -hmm. like because there's an animal it's goat simulator like i what you know but uh you know there were a variety of mistakes that i made there like not having enough enemies and so forth to really get across the full you know like depth of what i had in mind so basically it was not a vertical slice of the design Mm -hmm. um and i had thought that doing and and the goat simulator comparisons of where you can just kind of be a velociraptor and mess stuff up and have fun like i knew that that was a thing Mm -hmm. like i knew that that would be something that some people would do and that would be kind of youtuber bait and that they'd have fun with that and i was like so much the better like whatever that that's one other kind of audience Mm -hmm. why not have them as well as the people who want to like strategically play as a velociraptor or speed run as a velociraptor and Mm -hmm. you know go through these places what i didn't what i failed to understand was that people would perceive it as only the one thing only the goat Mm -hmm. simulator part it was like okay well i mean yeah you can like eat a table but you know that's not like not eat it but you know break it apart and stuff but that's not like all there is to this like so the um because it's kind of a roguelike in certain Mm -hmm. ways um at any rate that sold really really poorly um 
and I was looking at so it sold like a couple of thousand dollars in a in a week, and I was looking at it and going, um, this doesn't even you know this is not remotely going to break mm-hmm. even. I will probably spend another forty thousand dollars or so if I want to complete this thing. And um, that's going to be kind of the bare minimum to call this 1.0 uh, to get out of early access. And um, at that point, I'm going to be, you know, really out of money and out of options. That doesn't seem smart. And my enthusiasm for working on a project under those conditions is pretty low. Um, I was getting, you know, I had been like all about that game and I was so excited about it. It still makes me kind of ache when I look at it and I'm like, oh man, that game was so much fun. I really want to, I really want to like finish making that, but, um, not under those sort of circumstances Mm -hmm. that was just way, that kind of sucked all the fun out of it and is one way to put it. But, um, anyway, um, so I pulled it off Steam and gave you refunds and uh, um, then just made it available for free. It's a free-to-play game. That was the lesser of the various um, evils uh, because that was the way that I would lose the least amount of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, people responded to that really positively in the main. And suddenly we had a bunch of people who were like, don't refund me. No, no. And people who were buying a bunch of extra copies and like people who were giving us like tips through PayPal and stuff. And, you know, I was going to get eaten on all those, um, uh, bank transaction fees, you know, so I'd actually make negative money. Like when you do a refund, Mm -hmm. uh, from a, with a developer, like, uh, the money goes away that was never theirs to begin with. But then also, uh, there's, you know, the bank processing fees go away. Uh, well, rather, don't go away. They get passed on to the developer. So, um, you know, I was set to, you know, lose, I don't know, a few hundred dollars at least um, in bank fees. Um, and, um, you know, the people that were like, no, 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 like, we've already gotten enough enjoyment out of it to be worth the five bucks we paid for this and stuff, mm-hmm. you know they wound up covering the cost of that. So, uh, plus wow. some, so it actually made a tiny bit of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I mean, not in a break even sense, cause I spent months developing it, uh, in our artists and so on on it. And then that, um, uh, you know, so it's massively in the red from a profit standpoint, but in terms of actually after release, we didn't make further red, we actually, you know, in like bank fees. So that was that was pretty cool of people. And um, it was actually kind of so unprecedented on Steam that we ran into some troubles where they were unable to process both um, kind of unlimited refunds as well as have it free to play at the same time. So we had to kind of switch it back and forth between the two so that people could do the refunds that, you know, without having to like escalate. And so that the, uh, then everybody could have it for free. So it was, that was kind of a circus for a little while because they'd never had that combination of things before where they had a game that was paid that people bought, but then needed to be able to refund infinitely. But then now was also <laughs> free to anybody that hadn't happened before. So, um, so that was, that was interesting. Um, but, uh, valve actually suggested that. Cause I was like, you know, I want to make it so they can keep the game and, but also get a refund. They're like, well, there's not really a way they could do that on Steam unless it's like free for everybody. And you could do that if you wanted. And I was like, oh, actually, that's a really good idea. I'd never thought of that. So, you know, because I made this thing, it's just going to sit somewhere. Otherwise, I'd rather at least people play it because I thought it was fun. Um, mm-hmm. So, so all that happened. And um, then it was like, all right, so the plan is we're going back to basics here. AI war. Uh, People have been clamoring for a sequel for that uh, for, you know, years now. And there is nothing we know how to do better than make AI war. And so we're going to take a lot of the things that we learned in a technical sense while we were making uh, Stars Beyond Reach and the Raptor game and the modability stuff for Star Star Wars Rogue. And we're wrapping that into, you know, recoded from the ground up. 
new version of AI War, which is uh, you know a sequel, which is uh, you know fully moddable like Star Wars Rogue was, uh, heavily heavily multi-threaded AI and so forth like Stars Beyond Reach was. Um, uh, a bunch of other optimizations like Stars Beyond Reach, and then in 3D, like Release Reactor was, and yeah. So I mean, it's oh, and you know, using the new Unity GUI like um, Release Reactor was. So it's really um, some of those other projects that didn't work out are kind of paying dividends into AI War 2 because there's a whole lot of um, code and tech assets and so forth and just experience and whatnot that we've built up in the last couple of years that this AI war uh, sequel either would have cost far more or it wouldn't have been possible Mm -hmm. uh, or it wouldn't look like this. It wouldn't be 3D. It wouldn't be multi-threaded in this fashion, et cetera. One of those two things wouldn't have happened. Um, But instead we're able to do more, but also at a lower price. Mm -hmm. Um, Thanks to all that past work. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, a whole lot to unpack there, Chris, regarding what's yeah. been going on. Um, it's been a tough year. I know. And we were planning on talking with you earlier in June, I think. I think it was May or June, just around the time of Stars Beyond Reach. And then, of course, the news hit there. But yeah, I think, again, the first part of this podcast, we can definitely, again, bring back regarding some of that challenges of being able to release a game and I definitely have questions for you regarding AI Wars 2 but I want to go back to Stars and Raptor for a second Good, while I'm sure. still while I saw this law in my mind one of the challenges I think we've seen and again this goes back to being able to build a studio and grow is just knowing what kind of game you want to make and knowing where to take it as you were saying with Stars Beyond Reach, you've been working on this game for how long was the game of development for? Um, with the full staff, um, I think 11 mm-hmm. months, and then it was another six there. And I always set out with um, some very concrete things of this is what I want it to feel mm-hmm. like, and this is what I want certain things to work like, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and we started out with a very, you know, detailed design document and so forth. But at the same time, when we're doing a game like that, mm-hmm. it's highly, highly experimental. Yeah. And so a lot has to be teased out during the prototyping. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, yeah. I had about a $200,000 um, war chest when I started that. Mm-hmm. And I figured that would be plenty. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was wrong. Um, but... Uh, you know, if you're going to have rapid iteration, you know, prototyping like mm-hmm. that, I mean, you have to, you know, plan ahead for that in some fashion. And we did, um, but basically tried to change too many things all at one mm-hmm. time, probably. And so that uh, that made it, you know, just maybe too different from other 4X mm-hmm. games to where we were having to figure out too many things from yeah. scratch. And that was the point that I wanted to touch on. It's one thing I'm hearing a lot from other developers I've spoken to and even watch their development, especially thanks to early access and the ability to literally see a game go from point zero zero one alpha to a finished title. And when you're trying to experiment while building the game at the same time, it just adds so much more stress and challenge to that game. We talk about in the past about quote unquote finding the fun. You know, when does this become yeah. something that people will enjoy that you can actually start selling? And you said the same thing with Raptor as well, with trying to figure out is this something that people would be that is worth people spending money on? And Right. And with that one I took the approach of let's do what the reverse of what early access generally does. And I still think this is a smart move and in a past market would have worked. I sold the game for five bucks Mm -hmm. and I felt that for the amount of fun you get just being a Raptor for all the Raptor enthusiasts that are out there, which there are a lot from what I can tell, um, the fun of doing that and exploring some procedurally generated 3d levels and this, that, and the other, uh, it was worth five bucks. And, um, and that we could easily develop out more stuff. And 
if people liked it some but not a huge amount then the price could just stay five bucks and nobody would feel ripped off and you know we'd wrap up development in like two months or something Mm -hmm. but if people were like super excited about it then we could uh, gradually raise the price to ten dollars and then fifteen dollars over the course of early access and um, then you know that's that's how much goat simulator costs is I think fifteen dollars and um, again this is not goat simulator but I'm like mm-hmm. this is like goat simulator plus all this other stuff and you're a raptor not a goat like this should be a no-brainer sort of a thing mm-hmm. and um, you know, and it's not like buggy and weird like Goat Simulator, mm-hmm. and you know, and it looks really pretty, and you know, this you know this should fit well in the market, and um, you know, there's yeah, I mean that obviously didn't work out, and I think that a lot of that has to do with the market on that particular game. Um, we had a lot of pre-release awareness and repeat coverage about the game, but the the narrative in the press got away from me, mm-hmm. and that was one of the things that uh, that made me realize it was time to pull it because everybody was starting to go, oh, this is a goat simulator mm-hmm. game, or oh, Arkin is cashing in after um, after various setbacks. They've decided to just make a cash grab with a goat simulator knockoff, and I was like, okay this has now become like the quote official narrative Mm -hmm. uh, on the internet about this game. I can't control that. And that is poison. So I need to back off Mm -hmm. on this. Now, what I do hope is that the story of how all this went down means that maybe in a few years, uh, maybe there will be some hunger for uh, in case of emergency release Raptor two, Um, which is that game, but actually built all the way out. Um, and at that point, there's a first game out there, you know, the free one at this point. And there's precedent. And, you know, there's a narrative there about, hey, this was a passion project of Chris. He's weird and really <laughs> likes Raptors. And, you know, uh, you know, more distance from Goat Simulator at the time. Mm-hmm. And hopefully the market in general is in a better state then. So maybe I can revisit it then. Um, and that's kind of my hope. But at this point, it's like a very distant sort of a someday in the future sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but with like Stars Beyond Reach, you do have to find the fun as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of trying to, and I was trying to do that. But you run into big trouble with 4X or really complicated strategy games in particular because those are inherently systems games. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have so many systems developed and those require a ton of interfaces and a bunch of other stuff before you can really judge if it's fun. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you can judge if it's satisfying to like place buildings Mm -hmm. or whatever. But I mean, if you think about like SimCity, um, if you who take out massive parts of SimCity, um, there's, there, there really isn't a vertical slice of SimCity that, that works, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Like, you can take out the art or something, I guess, but um, gameplay-wise and interface-wise, it is very much a the sum of its parts sort of game, and I think that's inherent in 4X titles. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the big deals with Stars Beyond Reach that was such trouble versus uh, we had a much looser, similar, but uh, overall, with, with Star Wars Rogue, the roguelike, we had somewhat hard, somewhat loose design uh, for that. You know, we wanted it to be kind of like the Binding of Isaac, but more schmuppy mm-hmm. and with more interesting enemies and more interesting tactical stuff. And there were certain boundaries about, like, how exactly this would function that we knew it would have. And um, we had... Um, myself as the overall producer and kind of chief designer, we had a different person designing all the bosses, somebody who was designing enemies in general, and the boss guy was also doing some of them. We had one person who was designing all of the uh, items, and then they also designed uh, some of the mini bosses. And then we had uh, um, two artists on it, and um, we had... um, mainly one programmer on it and that 
was the bulk of the team. So that's a number of different designers there. And I was kind of riding herd, so to speak. And um, it came out really, really well. That's one game that, uh, aside from Tidalis, that's probably the game that I am least directly responsible for the design of. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's one of our best games. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know what that says about me, but um, I think it's really cool. And I, I think I get to say that a bit more partly because it's not like that's that one is not my head baby Mm -hmm. you know um much as i wish i could claim that Mm -hmm. um and so that worked out really really well there because we had a really defined okay this is the amount of prototyping space that we have and the amount of uh exploration that we've got and yada 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 Mm -hmm. and then on the other end of thing you know if we'd started with a giant design document i think that would have been to the detriment Mm -hmm. of it but then, like with AI War 2, we've got a 160 plus page um, public design document um, where we're being extraordinarily ex- explicit about exactly what is and is not in this sequel and what is different from the first one and what is the same and, you know, all that sort of thing. And I think that's absolutely necessary in this particular case that you don't get people going, well, I thought that it would have blah, 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 or, you know, I didn't realize it was going to change this, 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 or, you know, all those sort of things. And um, also so that we could properly budget and not be designing as we go because, we already had a very strong model in the first game. This is a sequel. It's not exploratory like the first one was, you know? Um, So you were talking earlier about how there's no one way to make games. And I really think that holds true because we've used so many different approaches. And I think it um, is best tailored to the game in question. Um, I think Stars Beyond Reach is probably, sorry, Starward Rogue, the roguelike, the short timeline one, is probably my greatest achievement as a project manager. Mm-hmm. That project went off perfectly. It went off without a hitch. It went off so well until it didn't sell. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that didn't have to do with the actual process of creating it. Um, so, I mean, you know, but then The Last Federation, as a project manager, I bungled a lot of things with that. And then it sold like hotcakes, you know. And so... It doesn't always have to do with the, you know, quality of um, management or design or programming or anything. Sometimes it's, there's an X factor there. Mm -hmm. And like talking about a game like Stars Beyond Reach, and again, that kind of approach when you're having to build multiple systems on top of each other, it goes back to, again, that challenge of experimental games. And if we get on that topic, that's another two hours easily. <laughs> but to quickly sum up and sort of link to what we've been talking about, as you said, Chris, games like Stars Beyond, Star Beyond Reach, or even something like Renowned Explorers, Clockwork Empires, Prison Architect, these aren't games that you can just take one thing out and it will be an amazing game. As we said, they are the sum of their parts. And getting to the point where the game works like that is very challenging. And it's something I would love to, like, dedicate a cast to. Like, actually design a game around that's not just one system, but, again, the SimCity approach or Clockwork Empires, etc. And... Right. Sometimes these games don't la- don't hit that you know aha moment for five to six months down the road. Um, with yep. uh, Renowned Explorers, I talked with Adrian from Abbey Games about it, and he said it was a nightmare to develop that game because they had no idea how they wanted to make that game at the start, and it didn't click for them until I think like nine or ten months down the road that you start to, they started to see the fun. They started to see some that people would be interested in playing. That was the case for me with the original AI mm-hmm. War 2. Uh, and that was uh, the original, not the original AI War 2, the original AI mm-hmm. War also. <laughs> uh, you know, but I wasn't on the clock. Yes. Yet. You know, I wasn't doing this for a living. And so there wasn't pressure per se. I mean, there was, you know, kind of amusement and, and just, hmm, what do we do about this now, you know? But uh, it was uh, five months or at least before I really had something that I started feeling like, this is not kind of fun. Like, this is legitimately, legitimately fun. And, 
the whole idea of the asymmetry of the AI, which is, of course, the biggest marquee feature of that game and like its breakout thing, that didn't even occur to me until five months mm-hmm. in. Like I was building, I mean, in the game, like day one, like I started out, it was turn-based, you know, and that didn't work out all that well. So I tossed that. I mean, I had specific things I wanted to elicit Mm -hmm. in the player. You know, I wanted to be able to play, even if you know the game super well, Mm -hmm. because I wanted to be able to play. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel like Enderwig. I wanted to have an AI that was actually interesting to face. And I had some experience with um, AI design and tweaking and tuning. And I'd been um, messing with uh, Supreme Commander and I felt like I could do a better job than what had been going on in that. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very different game uh, for a long time until I finally hit upon one key realization, which is it doesn't matter what the AI is doing behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. All that matters is what the player feels like the AI is doing. So in other words, you can write the most robust economic simulation behind the scenes for the AI that you want to. If the player never sees it, it may as well not exist. So why not just skip all that and just write something that's far simpler and that gives the player interesting challenges, but in a non-rule-breaking way. So there we quickly come to the thing of, the AI is basically playing risk while you're playing an RTS. And, um, you know, you have different, wildly different unit production and economic uh, systems between you and the AI. But then, of course, once you actually reach the battlefield, um, you know, you guys play by the same rules. And uh, so it's not a cheating AI. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and from a tactics standpoint, there's zero cheating AI about it. But, uh, from a um but it's also not a human player stand in ai it's not trying to be like a human player it's trying to be you know a galaxy of things I, one of the things i likened it to was like uh many of the ais in rts games are kind of like playing against um like playing the mario brothers if the only enemy was shadow mario and he could do everything that you could do, and all you ever did was play Shadow Mario, that would not be all that interesting. Mm-hmm. And that I kind of like it, the, uh, the AIs and a lot of other RTS games is essentially being that. And I was like, why not create mm-hmm. you know, the whole Mushroom Kingdom with all these different yeah. you know, types of AI and obstacles and stuff, and it's not balanced per se, because it's like Mario versus like a thousand dudes, but you know, uh, it's also not like a thousand dudes falling on Mario all the time. I mean, unless it's Mario Maker, then it's like, you know, the Kaizo levels. But <laughs> uh, that's something else. Yeah. But. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, share with your friends. It always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GWBicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.